continue with cirrhosis of the liver part 2. So this is a continuum of um, liver dysfunction in um, cirrhosis and the resulting clinical manifestations. So you have liver inflammation which can end up with liver necrosis and liver fibrosis and scarring. Liver inflammation can cause pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, fatigue. And um, liver necrosis can lead to decreased bilirubin metab metabolism, decreased bile in GI tract, and decreased vitamin K absorption and increased urobilinogen. Decreased metabolism of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and decreased plasma proteins. Also released, uh, results in increased um, liver enzymes, increased bilirubin, prothrombin time, and decreased albumin. Liver necrosis can ultimately can also result in result in altered hormone metab metabolism increased androgens and estrogens in the body and increased antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone causing edema. Liver necrosis can also result in liver failure, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatic coma and death. Liver fibrosis and scarring can result in portal hypotension resulting in ascites, edema, splenomegaly, varices, hemorrhoids and superficial abdominal veins which is caput medusae. There's another representation of clinical manifestations by system. So as you see, all the systems are affected, including the neuro neurologic, GI, reproductive, cardiovascular, meta metabolic, hematologic, as well as integumentary system. Diagnostic studies involves lab tests which shows elevated liver enzymes namely AST, ALT, LDH and alkaline phosphatase, elevated serum bilirubin levels, decreased serum albumin, elevated serum ammonia, bun and creatinine, prolonged prothrombin time, low serum RBC, hemoglobin and platelets, dilutional hyponatremia which is low serum sodium due to ascites, Plain X-ray of abdomen may show hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, or massive ascites. CT scan or MRI may be done. Liver ultrasound is useful to detect portal vein thrombosis and the direction of portal blood flow, and also to detect ascites, biliary stones, and obstruction. Liver biopsies may be necessary to detect the exact pathology, but the risk of bleeding is always there. Steps to minimize bleeding are to be taken. Esophagogastroduodenoscopy or EGD and endoscopic retrograde, retrograde cholangiopancreatograph or ERCP may be done to visualize the GI tract and the biliary tract to detect the presence of bleeding and obstruction related to stones respectively. Bleeding points can be sclerosed and stones removed during these procedures. Collaborative care. The goal of treatment is to slow the pro progress of cirrhosis and prevent and treat any complications. Conservative therapy includes rest, administration of B-complex vitamins, avoidance of alcohol, and minimization or avoidance of aspirin, acetaminophen, and NSAIDs. Management of ascites. Management of ascites is focused on sodium restriction, diuretics, fluid removal by means of paracentesis. Accurately assess and monitor fluid and electrolyte balance. Albumin infusion may be used to help maintain intravascular volume and adequate urinary output by increasing plasma colloidal osmotic pressure. Diuretic therapy is an important part of management often a combination of drugs that work at multiple sites in the nephron is more effective. Spironolactone is an effective diuretic even in patients with severe sodium retention. Spironolactone is an antagonist of aldosterone and is potassium sparing. A hypotensy loop diuretic such as furosemide, which is Lasix, is frequently used in combination with a potassium sparing drug. 
Tall Vapten or Samska, a vasopressin receptor antagonist, is used to correct hyponatremia in patients with cirrhosis. It causes an increase in water excretion, resulting in an increase in serum sodium concentrations. A paracentesis may be performed to remove acidic fluid or to test the fluid for infection. Reserved for patients with impaired respiration or abdominal pain caused by severe ascites. It is only a temporary measure because the fluid tends to reaccumulate. Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic portosystemic shunt or TIPS procedures used to alleviate ascites that does not respond to diuretics. TIPS may be done multiple times until a liver transplant may be made available. Esophageal and gastric varices. The main therapeutic goal for esophageal and gastric varices is to prevent bleeding and hemorrhage. The patient who has esophageal varices should avoid ingesting alcohol, aspirin, and NSAIDs. All patients with cirrhosis should have upper endoscopy or EGD done to screen for the presence of varices. The diagnosis of esophageal or gastric variceal bleeding tends to be made by endoscopic examination as soon as possible. Patients with varices are at risk, are at risk of bleeding they are started on a non-selective beta blocker like nadolol or propranolol to reduce the incidence of hemorrhage. Beta blockers reduce or decrease high portal pressure. Balloon tamponade or mechanical compression of varices may also be done. Sinks taken blackmore tube is the most commonly uh, used to control bleeding. If bleeding does occur, it is important to stabilize the patient first and manage the airway. IV therapy is initiated and may include administration of blood products. Management that involves a combination of drug therapy and endoscopic therapy is more successful than either approach done alone. Drug therapy for bleeding varices may include the use of sandostatin or octreotide vasopressin or terlipressin. The main goal of uh, drug therapy is to stop bleeding so that treatment measures can be initiated. IV administration of vasopressin produces vasoconstriction of this planktonic arterial blood, decreases portal blood flow and decreases portal hypotension. However, vasopressin has many side effects and including, including decreased coronary blood flow, dysrhythmias and increased blood pressure. Because of this, IV nitroglycerin is often given in combination with vasopressin. The nitroglycerin reduces the adverse effects of the vasopressin while enhancing its beneficial effect. Vasopressin should be avoided or used cautiously in the older adults because of the risk of cardiac ischemia. At the time of endoscopy, band ligation or sclerotherapy may be used to prevent re-bleeding. Endoscopic variceal ligation or EVL or banding is placement of a small rubber band around the base of the varix or the enlarged vein. Sclerotherapy involves injection of a sclerosin solution into the varices through an injection needle that is placed through the endoscope. Supportive measures for acute bleeding includes administration of our PRBCs or FFP or fresh frozen plasma, vitamin K or aqua mephiton, proton pump inhibitors including protonics, lactulose and uh, rifaximin to prevent hepatic encephalopathy from breakdown of blood and release of ammonia in the intestines, use of antibiotics to prevent bacterial infection. Because there is a high incidence of recurrent bleeding with each bleeding episode, continued therapy is necessary. Long-term management of patients who have had an episode of bleeding includes um, beta blockers, repeated band ligation of the varices, and portosystemic 
shunts or tips in patients who develop recurrent bleeding. Shunting procedures. Non-surgical and surgical methods of shunting blood away from the varices are available. Shunting procedures tend to be most used more after a second major bleeding episode than an initial bleeding episode. Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or TIPS is a non-surgical procedure in which a tract or shunt between the systemic and portal venous system is created to redirect portal blood flow. Various surgical shunting procedures may be used to, de to decrease portal hypertension by diverting some of the portal blood flow and at the same time allowing adequate liver perfusion. Currently, the surgical shunts most commonly used are the portocaval shunt and the distal splenorenal shunt. Hepatic encephalopathy. The goal of management of hepatic encephalopathy is the reduction of ammonia formation. Ammonia formation in the intestines is reduced with lactulose. This drug traps ammonia in the gut. It can be given orally as an enema or through a nasogastric tube. The laxative effect of the drug expels the ammonia from the colon. Non-absorbable antibiotics such as neomycin, metronidazole, and rifaximin or cefaxin may also be given, particularly in patients who do not respond to lactulose. It destroys the normal flora in the bowel, thus reducing the protein load. Constipation should be prevented. Control of hepatic encephalopathy also involves treatment of precipitating causes. This includes controlling GI bleed and removing the blood from the GI tract to decrease the protein load in the intestines. Nutritional therapy. The diet for patient who has cirrhosis without complications is high in calories, about 3000 calories per day with high carbohydrate content and moderate to low levels of fat. Protein restriction may be appropriate in some patients immediately following a severe flare of symptoms, that is episodic hepatic encephalopathy. However, protein restriction is rarely justified in patients with cirrhosis and persistent hepatic encephalopathy. Malnutrition is a more serious clinical problem than hepatic encephalopathy for many of these patients. To continue with nutritional therapy, a patient with alcoholic cirrhosis frequently has protein calorie malnutrition. For the patient with protein malnutrition, enteral formula supplements containing proteins may be given. Parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition therapy may be required. The patient with ascites and edema is placed on a low sodium diet. The degree of sodium restriction varies depending on the patient's condition. The patient needs instruction regarding the degree of restriction. Table salt is a well-known source of sodium, but sodium is also present in baking soda and baking powder. Foods that are high in sodium content include canned soups and vegetables, many frozen foods, salted snacks like potato chips, smoked nuts, smoked meats and fish, crackers, breads, olives, pickles, ketchups, and beer. Advise patients to read the labels. The patient and the caregiver need assistance to make the diet more palatable by the use of seasonings such as garlic, parsley, onion, lemon juice, and other spices.